Video games always have abilities to unlock, but sometimes they're just a little bit more elusive than others. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 rare video game abilities you had to unlock. Starting off with number 10, Yakuza Zero's Legend Styles. Now, most Yakuza games have the expected unlockable special abilities, moves you can get from spending experience, but Yakuza Zero does it just a little different. For one, instead of unlocking moves with experience, you buy them with cold hard cash, and for another, each character has their own hidden move set that can be unlocked by completing their individual side stories. So the standard three styles for each character contains a few elements that these characters are normally associated with, but considering Yakuza 0 is meant to be a prequel, their abilities aren't quite as developed as they would be in other games in the series. If you actually want to see Kiryu and Majima back in classic form, then you're going to have to unlock their legend styles. Kiryu's Dragon of Dojima style unlocks when you finish the Real Estate Royale game, while Majima's Mad Dog of Shimano style. Now, these are both pretty huge little side stories that take a lot of time and effort, but trust, the reward is worth it. These unlockable styles are by far the most powerful movesets in the whole game. If you're a longtime fan, finally getting to play as Majima the way that he appeared in so many of the other games is pretty awesome. The side stories alone will basically double the standard playtime to finish, but the reward for finishing them is so good that it is worth it. And number nine, Skyrim's Soul Tear, probably one of the most powerful dragon shouts in Skyrim, is also one of the strangest to unlock. To get this one, you gotta play through the Dawn Guard expansion, and to get through the part where you fight the dragon in the Soul Cairn. This allows you to use the shout where you can summon the dragon for help, which costs a dragon soul every time you want to use it. And what's odd is every time you summon him, he doesn't actually do anything except teach you one of the three required words for soul tear. So to fully learn the shout, you got to summon the dragon three separate times. That means if you want to learn this shout, you actually have to spend six dragon souls instead of the usual three, but it's worth the extra cost because when you cast a soul tear, it does 300 damage, which is pretty good right from the start. But if you kill an enemy with it, it'll fill a soul gem, and on top of that, also brings the dead enemy back to life to fight for you. For you. For you. I said it three times just to be sure that he understood. They only stay reanimated for about 60 seconds, but like, it's pretty great to have some assistance because this shout's fast cooldown is actually a lot faster than the old Fuzzro Da. So on top of everything, this shout's great for knocking enemies down too. A lot of people think it's the best overall shout in the game, and it's kind of hard to argue with them because Soul Tear is, it's damn good. And number eight is Elden Ring's Reign of Arrows. Unlike most of the other entries on this list, this isn't exactly the best power in Elden Ring. What's special about this move is more how rare it is and how finding it is a massive pain in the ass. So much so that a lot of veteran players just pass up on it. For everyone else, it's in a spot you probably don't even think was possible to reach. So it's a jumping puzzle and it's nice that jumping is in Elden Ring. It does add a verticality to the game. However, this is not one of those parts where I would consider that just like a really shining, good Good, perfect example of that. Um, the ash was found southeast of the minor Erd tree in the Dragon Barrow area, and the only way to get it is to carefully fall off a cliff onto some roots and slowly work your way down until you reach this isolated area below. To say actually getting down here is easier said than done is an understatement. Like when I first found this spot, I just assumed it was an unintentional area and gave up trying to get down. But no, you're actually meant to be able to get down here. So it's possible to actually use the spirit spring instead to get down here. Like it's very cheesy, but it does work. The art itself is pretty cool as it lets you rain arrows down from the sky on enemies. But in terms of actual effectiveness, eh, let's say it's situational. Like it can be good, but it's not always. So it's obscure, it's hard to get, and it's okay. Still, it deserves a spot on this list. And number seven is Xenoblade Chronicles 3's Hazard Neutralization. One of the most satisfying new features introduced in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 are these traversal skills, which get unlocked as you recruit heroes to your cause. A few are required and a few are optional, but all of them make getting around the world a little easier. The majority of them are not hard to get, seriously. Um, wall climbing and rope sliding get unlocked first by literally just following the story, for example. But this ability, which makes it so you don't take damage from hazardous surfaces like poison swamps, it's only unlocked after you unlock a secret character. So, only way you get this character to appear is to complete a series of seemingly random quests. 
like seriously, there's very little connecting these things. So the only way you do them all is if you read a walkthrough or just do every quest you get in the game. And I don't know if you noticed, but Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is huge. Its world is huge. And if you miss just one of the many steps required to make this character appear, you're stuck. Now the ability sounds mundane. Neutralizing the hazardous surfaces of the game doesn't sound like it'd be that big of a deal, but it's really useful. A lot of the like end game and post game locations are filled with poison swamps and fighting enemies in those areas is is pretty much impossible. So if you don't have this ability, these areas are, uh, they suck a lot. Borderline inaccessible. And you almost really never see secret characters in RPGs anymore, let alone ones that are this good. Like there's other secret characters in this game, but none of them give you an ability as useful as hazard neutralization. And number six is Metroid Prime 2's Sonic Boom weapon combo. Now, weapon combos are kind of the forgotten power-ups of the Metroid franchise. They only show up in Metroid Prime 1 and 2, and they're usually hidden away in places you're unlikely to backtrack to. Probably the hardest one to find, or the easiest one to miss, maybe, is the Sonic Boom weapon combo. Uh, this one uses a ton of ammo, but it's incredibly powerful, and it's one of the best weapons in the game. To get it, you need two late-game abilities, so the Screw Attack and the Annihilator Beam. Then you backtrack to the dark version of the second area, uh, probably the most miserable, dark, confusing locations in the game, and a place that returning to is something I'd rather not do. But trust me when I say this, the Sonic Boom is worth it. And yes, obviously the title conjures one of the less popular Sonic the Hedgehog games from the last decade. We can't not say it, but this is in every way, way better than that. And number five is God of War's upgraded Shattered Gauntlet of Ages. Uh, in its standard form, the Shattered Gauntlet of Ages isn't really a lot to write home about. Uh, like, I don't want to say it's the worst thing in the game, but it's really not that good. However, with a few upgrades and specific enchantments, it becomes a real powerhouse. Now, there's six possible enchantments you can slot into this thing, but you only need three, which is good because most of these things are pretty tough to get. Half of them can only be found by fighting the Valkyries, these incredibly difficult optional bosses, up to and including Queen Sigrun, the toughest fight in the game. Now you get at least three of the required stones, and the Gauntlet's basic force attack transforms into this devastating volley of homing projectiles. It's not completely game-breaking, but it's pretty effective on top of being, uh, I would say an amusing little Easter egg reference to the Infinity Gauntlet. Also, it's God of War, so it's a lot cooler. And number four, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask's Fierce Deity form. Uh, one of the more interesting additions to Majora's Mask, other than the whole time-traveling premise, are the masks. Yeah, word in the title. As it turns out, it's not just Majora's Mask. There's lots of them. And they completely alter Link's abilities when he puts them on. Now, the most difficult mask to get also happens to be the best. That's the Fierce Deity Mask, which transforms Link into a literal warrior god. And to get it, you gotta find every single other mask in the game. It's by far the most powerful one in the game, too. There is, however, a big downside. You only get it in the room right before the last boss, and it can only be used against bosses. So the final battle in Majora's Mask is probably one of the toughest in the entire series, so it's not like that isn't appreciated to some extent, uh, and the Fierce Deity Mask does really make the fight a lot easier. And number three, Mega Man X, the original Mega Man X, the Hadouken. In most Mega Man games, you can unlock new armor pieces and weapons, but you don't really get new abilities, like just base standard abilities. You get stuff from like the bosses and stuff. And some of the armor has functions, obviously, but one of the few times a Dr. Light Capsule just gives you a reward that is not an armor upgrade of any kind is in the very first Mega Man X game. The Hadouken, taken from Street Fighter, is performed the same way. You do a quarter circle forward motion, press the shoot button. It's more than a gimmick, too. Like, it can do a lot of damage. Even if it's a little slow to come out compared to your standard buster shots, it's an ability that's actually pretty easy to use, but hard to get. Like, just try to wrap your head around this. After getting all the other capsule power-ups in the game, go to Armor Armadillo stage, jump off the minecart, onto the wall above the boss door, and collect the life pickup there. Now, inexplicably, you have to die and do that same thing three more times. On your fourth return visit, there will be a capsule there that gives you the Duke and power. I have no idea how somebody managed to figure this out, but that's how you do it. And number two is Final Fantasy X-2's Mascot Dress Sphere. Uh, this is a weird game, to say the very least. X is a pretty normal Final Fantasy. X-2 is 
different. It's a good game, but it's a weird game. It has these really unusual classes you can unlock, for instance. One of the hardest, but also best out of the classes. Actually called Dress Spheres, but I'm just going to call them classes because Dress Spheres is... I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. But uh, the class I'm talking about is the mascot. It gives all three party members uh, unique abilities related to the costume they're wearing. Unlocking these things is pretty simple. All you have to do is achieve the episode complete for every location in Chapter 5. Then this costume appears on your airship. Sounds easy. Uh, uh, but I will say, easy is not a synonym for simple, in this case at least. I'm sure in some instance it is, but here it's not. It's actually kind of a nightmare, because uh, getting completion in this game, it, it can be a total nightmare. Like, when this game says completion, what it really means is pretty vague. Basically, you have to finish all the events in every area. Uh, the problem is these events can be difficult and awkward to trigger, and are sometimes multiple chapters apart, and if you miss one step in a previous chapter, you won't be able to finish it later. Like, there's a lot of permanently missable content in this area. Area, and actually seeing all of that can be kind of confusing. It's so bad that even if you're closely following a guide, it's not really difficult to screw it up. Like, at least you don't have to get to 100% completion in the entire game to unlock these things. You only have to get to about 95%. The mascot class is probably one of the best in the entire game, but if you're not interested in 100% in the game, it's probably not really worth the trouble. And finally, at number one, Star Wars Galaxy's Jedi Powers. It doesn't get a lot harder to unlock than this. Uh, in the original version of the Star Wars Galaxy's MMO, there wasn't a Jedi class. They wanted the Jedi to be rare and powerful, so there's a hard limit on the amount of Jedi that would appear on any given server. And if you became one, you could be permakilled. If you wanted Jedi powers, you had to become Force-sensitive, which was a tedious process, which was eventually made easier, but at first it was a huge ordeal. That's just the start of it, though. You have to go through an entire quest line to become a Jedi Padawan, which is also incredibly time consuming um like the developers just eventually gave up on the whole system just made it so you could just choose to play as a jedi but for those first few years if you wanted to use force powers in star wars galaxies you really had to work for it a couple of bonuses for you too first castlevania symphony of the knights poison mist form it's kind of pointless and it's a huge pain to get it makes it so your mist form can hurt enemies but the only way to get it is to beat the toughest boss in the game and at that point you just kill most things with one hit anyway so there's not really a lot of point to the poison mist form and the final bonus we have for you is final fantasy 7's ability to fly anywhere for most of the game you're limited where you can go in final fantasy 7 even when you get an airship the game doesn't let you land in forests the only way to get everywhere is to get a golden chocobo which is like one of the most infamously hardest difficult things to do in an RPG. You basically have to do the breeding minigame, make perfect combinations until you get the ultimate crossbreed chocobo that can do everything the others can do and cross every type of terrain. I say that in this tone because I have done it. Now the only reason you would ever need to do this is to unlock the final summon, Knights of the Round, but it's also just fun to run everywhere you could possibly want to on the map, even if it's kind of pointless. That's all for today. Leave us a comment and let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications, and as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.